Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the next webinar in the Rus Copernicus series. My name is Teresa Roth, and I will be guiding you through the session today. We will look at an advanced method of SAR differential interferometry, which is called resistance scatter or interferometry, and we will be using the STAMPS software. This webinar is a direct continuation of the webinar given in December 2020, which was called SNAP to STAMPS Data Preparation for PSI, and we will be using the data set prepared in this past webinar. So first, let's have a look at the outline of this session. We will start, as usual, with the introduction to the Rus service. Then I will move on to tell you some words about the persistence scatter interferometry. Then I will show you which software we will use during the session. And then we will say something about the study area and the data used. And then finally, we will move on to the Rus virtual machine for the actual hands-on exercise. The session will close with a live Q&A session. And uh, the entire session will take approximately one and a half hours, and it is being recorded and will be available on the Rus Training YouTube channel and also on the Rus Training portal, where you can also find the Q&A summary document. Now, if you have any questions during the webinar, don't hesitate to let us know. So we don't have questions piling up towards the end. And let's start with the introduction to RUS service. So RUS stands for Research and User Support for Sentinel Core Products. And it's a project that is funded by the European Commission and managed by the European Space Agency. The RUS service is divided into two categories. The first is the training activities and the second, the individual users and R&D projects. The training activities include face-to-face -face training and virtual classrooms webinars and support to webinar replay, and also support to external training organization and operation. The participants to all the training events can take advantage of a limited number of remote desktop virtual machines, which are accessible via a browser and are ready to use and pre-installed with a variety of open source toolboxes, including SNAP, QGIS, and development environments such as, for example, Anaconda or the Jupyter Lab. Regarding the individual users and R&D projects, Rus Copernicus provides support to individual projects through a new solution with Docker container image containing the complete Rus virtual environment and tools, and it will be provided upon request. The container can then be deployed on users' own infrastructure, which can be cloud-based, either in-house or acquired from a commercial provider, but it can also be deployed on a laptop or a PC. The ICT team is available to guide the users through the deployment procedure, and you can learn more information about Docker on the web page shown. RUS service is implemented in two portals. The first one is the RUS portal, where you can find all the information about the projects. You can create an account and request a virtual machine, and you can find all the news as well as all the description. Then we have the RUS training portal, which um, you presumably already know because you have registered to this webinar through the portal. And there you can find all our present and past and future um, training sessions and webinars. And you can also uh, create an account to access our e-learning portal there, where you can find a number of lectures on different topics. Finally, as I've already mentioned, we also have a YouTube channel, which is called Roost Training, and we upload all the webinar recordings on the YouTube channel here. So you will be able to find the recording of this webinar there soon. Now, as I've mentioned, this webinar is based on what you have learned during the webinar that was given in December 2020. If you have not followed the webinar yet, I would recommend following it because this webinar covers the pre-processing of the data that we will be using today. So today we will not start with a Sentinel-1 product as you can download it, but we will start with already pre-processed data set. And here, watching this webinar and following the steps, you can learn all the steps that are necessary to take to derive exactly the same data set that we will be using today. And now let's move on to the introduction to the persistence scatter interferometry. PSI is an advanced differential interferometric method, which involves processing of large time series of SAR scenes, and it allows for a better selection of coherent pixels. It also allows to estimate 
a DEM error. It also allows for more reliable 3D face unwrapping and also for the reduction of atmosphere and orbit errors by filtering in time and space. And it can also allow for subpixel resolution. Now, PSI requires a large number of scenes acquired over the same area. Typically, we need a minimum of 15 to 20 images to perform a C-band PSI analysis. It is possible to use shorter time series, for example, with X-band PSI due to a higher resolution and the shorter wavelength of this band. However, the larger number um, of the available scenes um, the better quality of the PSI, the formation velocity and the time series will be. It is an opportunistic method, which means that it is only possible if permanent scatters are available in the study area. The permanent scatter or PS density is usually low in vegetated or forested areas, also in low reflectivity areas such as very smooth surfaces, and for example, snow coverage, construction works, uh, street repavement and others can cause complete or partial loss of the permanent scatter. By contrast, permanent scatters are usually abundant on buildings, monuments, antennas and other man-made objects, but also on exposed rocks or outcrops. The lack of permanent scatters or a low PS density over a given area can be mitigated by deploying artificial coronal reflectors. And these device devices are installed in situ and provide a strong response in the SAR images, resulting in good interferometric phase to derive the deformation estimates for their location. By using corner reflectors, it's possible to strategically locate the deformation measurement points, although this approach, of course, requires access to the area of interest to install the corner reflectors. PS algorithms operate on a time series of interferograms, which are all formed with a respect to a single master image. And also no filtering or multi-looking is applied in the PS processing, as all of these techniques degrade the resolution, and by that, add more scatters to each resolution element. And since non-dominant scatters are considered as noise sources for resistant scatter of pixels, increasing their number in the pixel or in the resolution cell can lead to an increase in the correlation and loss of the resistant scatter pixel. Actually, oversampling is usually preferred to avoid the resistant scatters being at the edge of the pixel, for example. The PSI suffers severe limitations in the capability to measure fast deformation phenomena due to the ambiguous nature of its observations. Now, for Sentinel-1, considering the wavelength and the revisit time, the maximum differential interferometry rate that is measurable is 42.6 centimeters per year. However, this is a theoretical value, and the actual capability to estimate the deformation rates, of course, depends on the noise level of the data and the specific phase and rapid technique used to resolve the phase ambiguities. The first step in the processing is the identification and selection of the usable persistent scatter of pixels. There are two main approaches or families of approaches for this. And the first one relies on modeling of the deformation in time. And the second relies on the spatial correlation of the deformation. In the first approach, the phase is unwrapped during the selection process by fitting a temporal model of the evolution to the wrapped phase difference between the pairs of nearby persistent scatterers. In the second approach, the phase unwrapping algorithm is applied to the selected pixels without assuming a particular model for the temporal evolution. I will not go into more detail here. Um, however, in today's exercise, we will use the second approach, which is implemented in one of the most widely used tools for persistent scatter interferometry, which is the STAMPS software developed by Andrew Hooper. Uh, and others in 2004. They propose a persistent scatter selection using a phase characteristics, which is suitable to find also low amplitude natural targets with phase stability that cannot be identified by amplitude based algorithms. Now, I talk a lot about the persistent scatters. So let's just quickly explain what the persistent scatter or what a persistent scatter is. Majority of SAR pixels will contain a number of different scatterers 
and the echoes of all of these scatterers or objects or surface types in the resolution cell will sum up to give one face value for this cell or pixel. The correlation is caused by contribution from the scatterers within a pixel summing up differently for each of the images in the interferometric pair. This can be, for example, due to relative movement of the scatterers, a change in look direction of the radar platform, or appearance or disappearance of scatterers, as for example in the case of snow cover. However, if one scatterer returns a significantly more energy than the other scatterers in the pixel or resolution cell, the decorrelation phase is greatly reduced. We call such pixel the persistent scatterers or permanent scatterers. As I mentioned already in the previous slide, the persistent scatterers are usually abundant in urban environments, for example, roofs oriented such that they reflect energy directly backwards, so directly back to the sensor, like a mirror, or um, for example, double bounce, so corner reflectors really, where the energy is reflected once from the ground and then once from a perpendicular structure, causing it to return to the direction from when it came, again, directly to the sensor, and therefore giving very high response or very strong response. And the dominant scatters can, of course, also occur in areas without man-made structures that are conveniently oriented towards the sensor. However, there is usually fewer of them, and then they tend to be less dominant or give a less strong response. Now, that was the introduction to the permanent scatter interferometry. It was very quick. However, I will give you at the end some tutorials and some um, literature that you can read to expand your knowledge still on this. Fortunately, to go very much into depth is uh, out of the scope of this uh, session. And now let's move on to the software that we would need to install. Now, this software does not come with the exception of Snap and um, Snafu. It does not come pre-installed on the Rust Virtual Machine. So if you request a Rust Virtual Machine and you will want to repeat this exercise, you will have to install this software by yourself. Now, as usual, with this webinar, there is, there is going to be a PDF file with all the steps detailed, and you can also find there how to install all of this software in your Rust Machine or in your laptop. Now, note that I will explain the installation in the file or in the um, guide only for Linux platforms, not for Windows, because there's problems with running stamps on Windows that are well documented already, and um, I will not go into that more here. Now, the first is Snap and Snap to Stamps toolboxes. So Snap toolbox is automatically pre-installed on the machines, um, and Snap to Stamps is really a um, number of Python routines that you can use um, to, uh, pro to process, pre-process your data to be able to input them into stamps. And this all is covered in the previous webinar that I have mentioned. So I will not address this anymore today. But for today, we will for sure need MATLAB. Now note that this is a commercial software and a license is required. And it is required to run stamps. So if you want to repeat this exercise, you will have to secure your own MATLAB license. Rus does not distribute MATLAB licenses. We cannot do that. So also, if you request a Rus virtual machine, MATLAB will not be installed. So please note that if you want to repeat this exercise. If you do have a MATLAB license or can acquire one, these are the toolboxes that you will need. So you will need the Perl computing toolbox, image processing toolbox, signal processing toolbox, and the statistics and machine learning toolbox. Then, of course, apart from MATLAB, you will need STAMS, which stands for Stanford Method for Persistent Scatterers. And as I've already mentioned, it's a software package that implements an INSAR persistent scatterer method. And it was developed to work even in terrains devoid of man-made structures and, for example, in terrains undergoing non-steady deformation. Next, we also need SNAFU. Then we have SNAFU, which is an implementation of the statistical cost network flow algorithm for phase unwrapping, and it was proposed by Chen and Zapker. And um, this algorithm is usually installed or pre-installed on Rus machines. However, in the PDF guide that will be provided to you or that you can download from the Rus 
um, Copernicus portal, you will also find how to install this in case you are not working on Rus environment. Then we will also need the triangle, which is used for um, Delaunay triangulation. And we will also need some other packages. Just here, I give you a quick list. Optionally, you will also need Train, which is the toolbox for reducing atmospheric in SAR noise. And we will be using it in this exercise, but it is not absolutely necessary to have to run stamps. So you can run without Train. You just cannot use it to calculate the tropospheric correction. Then we will also be using the Stamps visualize, Visualizer, which is a very handy tool, um, R-based visualization tool for Stamps results. OK, and then now let's go into our study area a bit. So you know that in our RUS webinars, uh, whenever we talk about um, differential INSAR, we always focus on Mexico City. Now, Mexico City is very nice study area um, because it is subsiding in an extreme rate. And let me just tell you quickly why this is, so you can understand more about the study area. It is mostly built on a basin that was formerly occupied by an ancient Lake Texaco that has evolved since the Aztec arrival uh, in the 13th century. Currently, the lake is more, almost completely drained from its original water area of 700 kilometers squared, and it previously occupied the Valley of Mexico. The Valley of Mexico is mainly formed by volcanic materials, while the surface layers consist of alluvial deposits, mostly lacustrine clays. A large part of Mexico City is built on top of these highly plastic soft clay sediments, interlaid with thin silt and sand layers. The clay deposits of Mexico City are fairly unique, and they contain volcanic ash and are characterized by an unusually high plasticity index and very high natural water content, approximately between 200 to 600%, which is equal to the ratio of the weight of water to the weight of solids within the mass of soil. Now, this saturated deposit is extremely compressible, and it causes an extreme subsidence when groundwater is extracted and not replenished. Now, the city has grown from about 78 kilometers squared to a metropolis about 100 times larger, and in order to provide water for its growing population, gro the groundwater extraction has increased immensely. This, of course, causes many adverse effects in some part of Mexico City, and it causes them by sink to more than nine meters since the beginning of 20th century. Some studies estimate that the city pumps the water twice as fast as the aquifer is able to replenish, and this leads to continuous sinking or lowering of the underground water levels. You can see in this animation then the effect on the surface buildings and infrastructure, of course, when the water is extracted. Now, the extreme subsidence, of course, brings a number of serious issues that are quite often in the news, such as damage to the buildings, drainage, systems and infrastructure and many others. However, for us, this is an ideal study case because we can observe high rates of deformation in an area which will contain a lot of persistent scatter points or pixels since it's a city environment, of course. Now we will be using Sentinel-1, which is especially optimized for differential in-star processing due to its stringent orbit control and small perpendicular baselines. And we will be using um, 31 Sentinel-1 images acquired from November 1st, 2019 to November 1st, 2020 in 12 day intervals. Now we will not, as I've already mentioned, use this data as you can download them. We will start with a pre-processed data set that we have created during the webinar um, of December, 2020. As I've promised, here are some other resources for resistance scatter interferometry that you can read to learn more about the technique. And there's also some tutorials that you can find online. And I provide the links here for you. And now, finally, let's start with the exercise and let's move on to the virtual machine. So let me just log in. And here we go. And I will also increase the size of the window to the full screen. And now basically the Rus virtual machine just looks like my desktop. Um, so if you're already familiar with the Rus virtual machine, you know that there is a number of different toolboxes installed. 
Um, but as I've mentioned, not all that we will be using today are already presented there. So I will not explain how to install these because that would give for another webinar. Uh, but you have all the information about the installation and mostly about the configuration of those toolboxes and packages in the PDF guide that you will be able to download from the Ruskopernicus website in the coming days. So you can follow the steps there. Remember, those steps are only applicable to Linux. So if you need to modify them to Windows, unfortunately, you have to search for the appropriate information. So first, let me start with showing you the data that we will be using. So as I've mentioned, this webinar is a follow up of a webinar that we did in December 2020. You can rewatch it online and it is absolute prerequisite to follow these steps here because we will be using data that are processed that were that were processed during that webinar and we will be using the result of that pre-processing for any steps that we apply today. I have also left the folder name the same. So um, where this webinar is Haza 12, but the webinar in December was Haza 09. So the folder is still named based on the old webinar just to process everything in the same directory. And we had three different folders here, the auxiliary data original and the project. So the original contains or contained all of the input data. So all the 31 images that I've already mentioned. And um, the AUX data contained information about the area of interest and so on, which again relates to the webinar from December. Now, the most important directory for us is the project directory, where you will find a number of different directories containing the data that we have processed. And the most important is the INSAR directory with the master date here. This directory, when you finish the webinar that we have done in December, this is how the directory will look, and it will contain all the information that we need. I will not go any more to what each of these means. You, If you follow the webinar from December, you will see how this directory is created with all the steps. We have our data divided to 27 patches, so three by nine, or actually nine by three, uh, smaller patches for the purposes of uh, easier processing. And then we have a number of other um, files that are necessary. So to start, we will open MATLAB in this directory. And to open MATLAB, which I've already installed on this machine, I will open it via the terminal. Now, this is very important because all the settings or configuration that we are using for MATLAB to show where, for example, the stamps installation is installed and so on, are contained in the bash rc script that tells um, the terminal um, about the location of all the installations to be able to find them. If you open MATLAB from a desktop um, icon, for example, this will not be the case and MATLAB will not, then not be able to find stamps and the other packages. You can simply type MATLAB if you have MATLAB configured in your machine and the graphical interface will open. And here we go. And you see that on the Left side, we have the current folder, and the current folder at the moment corresponds to the INSAR directory. Now, for our data set, as I've mentioned, it's 31 images, uh, so 30 interferograms with all the same master, which in this case is 4th of May 2020. Now, in the beginning, or I will show you the processing for a single patch, just to speed up things a little bit and to speed up the visualization as well. But in general, you can run all the stamps steps from this directory right away, or you can run them separately from each patch. This is only possible until step four, so one to four, because as of step five or at the end of step five, all the patches are merged into a single image. Now, before we start with the processing, what we can do is actually check if our stamps and our train packages or toolboxes are well configured. And we can do that simply by running the command help and stamps. Now, this will just give you information about um, the command stamps that we will be using to run the steps of stamps. So you can see there is um, eight steps here, and we will run them one by one. Then 
The next, we can check whether the train is well configured. So that would be help. And for example, we can choose apps linear. And here we go. Again, the function exists and you can see the correct usage of this function. Now I will get back into uh, what this function means and how to use it a bit later. Now we can just check that this works. One last thing that we can check is if Snafu is well configured, at least in the system. And we can do this by opening a new terminal window. Do not do this in the terminal window that you opened MATLAB in. And we just type Snafu. Here we go. And again, we have a correct response. It doesn't say that the command does not exist, for example, and everything seems to be fine. So let's just close the window and let's start with the processing. First thing that we can do is check the default stamps parameters. To check them, you type get parm and you get the default parameters as set in stamps. Now I will talk about each of these parameters more or almost each of these parameters more at the specific steps that they relate to, so not right now, but we will change some of them during the exercise. And to change a parameter, you simply need to remember the name of the parameter and then um, the type of value. So for example, if it's a string, you need to add quotation marks. Otherwise you can simply um, put a number or for example, a tuple. So to change a parameter, you need to type set parm, set parm, and then brackets. And for example, if I want to now set a parameter, which we actually will change, which is called plot scatterer size, I can copy the name here. You can see that the plot scatterer size is in is a number. And I have to add quotation marks around the name of the parameter as well. And then just bracket comma, and then add a number that I wish to insert. So in this case, I will put 30. And this simply changes the size of the plotted points when we create plots from 120 to 30, which will give us a better view on the points anyway, because they will not overlap closer to the actual resolution of the data. So um, I will at the moment not change this, um, this parameter just for you to see how it looks with the 120. So let me just delete this and I will show you how it works later. So first I will enter the patch 14, which will be the one that we will be processing. So I can type CD patch 14. This one is approximately in the middle of our data set. And we can now type the first command to run the first step of stamps on this data subset. So I write stamps. And then in the brackets behind the command, you write the beginning step and the end step that you want to perform. So actually, in theory, you could run all the steps in one go. So I could run step one to eight. If I was in the uh, main um, directory, I could run steps one to eight. So let me now just type one, one. So I only want to run the first step. So it will start with first and end with first. And I just type run. Now this step simply loads the initial candidate persistent scatter pixels and and stores them in MATLAB workspace files, so .mat files. We can list these files by simply writing ls and then star for any character, one.mat. There we go. And you can see these are the files that have been created or loaded from the original data for the first step. And these data contain the information about the initial um, selected um, PS candidates. To learn even more about these points, we can now type PS info, which will give us the list of the interferograms that we have, including the perpendicular baseline information. We can also at this step plot the wrapped phase. 
And we can do this by a very useful command, which is called psplot. And we simply provide it w for wrapped face, and we click Enter. Now, this command is very useful. It can plot basically all the outputs and intermediate outputs of stamps. It will take a little bit to run in this case because it has to plot all the different interferograms, even though just for a small portion of the entire image. But um, let's just wait. And here we go. So you can see here, actually, we have 31 interferograms. And we can make them a little bit bigger like this. And we have all the interferograms, including interferogram, which is master master. So of course, the face is 0. And we can just quickly have a look that all the interferograms seem to be correctly formulated. There is no empty interferograms or any other issues with them, which we, of course, checked already in the pre-processing of the data. So there should not be any problem here. We can now minimize this. And a little bit more about the psplot command. So if you want to use, if you want to know all the usage of this command, you can simply type again, help PS plot. There we go. And you can find out all the different parameters that you can enter. So we can also visualize, for example, uh, the height for topography. We can visualize the wrapped face at this step. We can visualize spatially filtered face, unwrapped face once we perform the unwrapping, which we have not done yet. So at the moment, it's not possible. We can also visualize the stratified topocorrelated atmosphere which is derived using the train toolbox. So if you don't have it installed, this will not work for you, um, and so on. So many, many different um, options that we can visualize during the processing, and we will take advantage of that in a little bit. Now, what we can also do is to visualize only one interferogram, because of course, in this image, we do not see a whole lot of detail. So what I can now do is simply to type PS. Plot. And here on the top, you can see that the first is value type. So that's one of these. Then we have the type of background. Now, the main background that you can choose is zero for black background, one for white background, and um, five for the mean amplitude of all the different interferograms. So let's choose the mean amplitude, so five. And we will just simply write W and then sorry, five. Then the next value here is the limit. So in this case, we will just set zero and zero. And we want to visualize the first interprogram in the series. So one. So you can, uh, you can select, of course, from one to 31 here. And I just click run. And here we go. So as you can see, the image is slightly blurry. Um, and here in this area, we have less um, permanent scatterers, so less candidate points. You will see in a little bit why this is. But you can see that actually the um, fringes are very well formed here. So let's, let me just minimize this. And let's now change this parameter that I have mentioned before, which was the um, scatter um, point size. And I will just type set parm. And then and I will set it to 30. Enter. So now the parameter has been accepted. We can change it. We can check again the get parm um, just to see that it has actually changed. I will not do this now. And I will run the same command that I have run before. So the PS plot for the first interferogram. And let's click enter. And now we will see what difference this will make. And here we go. Let me open both of them next to one another. And here we go. So you can see the difference here. Of course, the plotted points are much smaller and 
it sort of appears much sharper, the image. And we can also see that in this area, basically, the number of um, scatterers is much lower. We have also a number of dark areas here, which correspond to water surfaces. And if you zoom in, which you can do here, you can also see that these still contain some uh, candidate permanent scatter pixels. So you can investigate the images more closer by zooming in. And now we can move to the step two. Now, the step two calculates the temporal coherence, and it is an iterative step that estimates the phase noise value, or gamma, for each candidate pixel in every interferogram. The processing step is governed by a number of different parameters. We will not go through all of them here because um, that would be for an hour just to explain them. Um, but I will tell you about some of them. So first, let me show you the parameters. And here we go. So these parameters, this list, is all the parameters that govern all the uh, stamps processing, so not only step two. And we will start for step two with this maximum topographic error. Now, this parameter is the maximum uncorrelated digital elevation model error in meters. And pixels that have the error larger than this will not be picked. Now, if we set this higher, it will increase the mean gamma value and more pixels will be selected. A typical value is about 10 meters. Here, the default is 20 and we will leave it as 20. The next uh, important parameter is the filter weighing scheme, so right here. And here it's set to P squared, which means the PS probability squared. And the other possibility is signal to noise, noise ratio. However, the P squared um, in general was shown to perform better, and that's why we are keeping it here. Now, these are the only two that I will talk about. The other parameters, just to name few, are um, the grid filter grid size, for example. Um, so this is the um, the data are then resampled um, for the calculation of the temporal coherence. They are resampled to a regular grid, and this is the grid size. Then we have uh, the combined low pass and adaptive phase filter and various parameters that pertain to that. And finally, also the maximum iterations for this, um, this step. So this step in, by default runs three iterations. So I said it's an iterative step. So it runs in three iterations, but you can change the number. And um, finally, also uh, whether the um, quick estimation procedure uh, for the gamma value should be employed or not. That is by default set to yes. So let me now run the step. It takes some minutes. I have speeded it up here for you. Um, as I said, it's uh, even for this small patch, it will take some time because it runs in three different um, iterations. And maybe while we are waiting, I will explain one more parameter, and that's the gamma change convergence, which here is set to 0 .05, 0 0.05, sorry. And this is a threshold for the change in the mean value of gamma. And when it ceases, when the change ceases to decrease beyond this threshold, then the iterations are stopped. So you can also control the number of iterations by, um, by this. And there we go. So the processing is finished. And if we now look back, we can see the gamma change change basically here. And this is the number that is then given, um, the, the threshold that is given by the gamma change convergence. So here we have 0 0.8. In the second iteration is 0 0.7. But in the third iteration already is 0 0.01. So it's not yet to the threshold or minus 0 0.015. But it's not yet down to the threshold of 0 0.005, of course. But we have set only three iterations in our um, in our parameter. So if we would have set 10, uh, maybe in the next step, it would already uh, meet this threshold. 
Okay, and let, let's now move on to the next step, which is step three. And step three is the initial permanent scatter selection. In this step, we make the selection of TS points based on probability by comparing to the results for data with random phase. This is usually done twice. After the first selection, the temporal coherence for each pixel is then re-estimated more accurately by dropping the pixel itself from the estimation of the spatially correlated phase. Now, the re-estimation is extremely time demanding and it can last for uh, only even this small patch um, for um, hours and hours. So what I would do now is you can actually disable this option um, by a parameter that you can see in the get parm. So let me type again, get parm, here we go. And the parameter is the select reestimate gamma flag. You can see that here by default is set to yes. And you can keep it, you can run it with the yes, but just note that when you're repeating this exercise, when you keep it as yes or keep it enabled, the step three will take very long time. So here for the purpose of this exercise, I will change it to no. So I will here type set form, and then I can copy here Now, control V, control C doesn't work here for me, so I have to use it like this. And let's put N, and there we go. And then now it's set. And some other parameters that govern uh, the step three are the select method. So there's two options. There is density or percent. And um, it's basically the selection method for selecting the pixels with random face. Um, we select those pixels that are most likely to be permanent scatters with a threshold determined by a fraction of false positives that we deem acceptable. And um, there's two methods, as I said, so there's percent and density. And here by default is density, so we will keep it as it is. And then you also have, of course, the actual threshold. So you have either density rand or percent rand. So here's percent rand. So if our selected method was percent, this would be the applied um, threshold or density rand here also set to 20. And now let's run step three. Here we go. I click enter. Now, I didn't say much about the acceptable values for the density and percent rand. So the density rand basically gives us the maximum, as I said already, uh, acceptable spatial density per kilometer squared of the selected pixels with random phase. And um, at this stage, we can usually accept higher density as most random phase pixels, pixels will anyway be dropped in the next step. So the step is finished. And we can move on to step number four. Now, in this step, the pixels that um, have been selected in the step three are weeded, which means that basically we drop pixels that have been selected due to signal contribution from the neighboring pixels and also those uh, PS points that are deemed or uh, seen as too noisy. And this step, again, is governed by um, number of different parameters. We have the weed standard deviation, which is by default set to one. Um, this is a threshold standard deviation, which basically for each pixel, the face noise standard deviation for all pixel pairs, including the uh, pixel is calculated. And if the minimum standard deviation is greater than the threshold, then the pixel is dropped. If we set it to 10, then no weeding or no, no noise-based weeding is performed at all. The general values or good initial values are 1 to 1.2. And then you have to see how your results look and if you need more weeding um, or less, for example. The next parameter is weed maximum noise. So that's by default set to infinite. And it's the threshold for the maximum noise allowed for a pixel. Now, for each pixel, the minimum pixel pair noise is estimated per interferogram. And the pixels with maximum interferogram noise um, that is higher than this value are then dropped. Next parameter is weed time. 
that is the size of the um, sorry weed time window, which is the size of the window in days. So it's for the temporal weeding. And then we have also weed neighbors. So this enables the weeding of neighbors or not. Um, basically enables proximity weeding. And if we set it to yes, the pixels are dropped based on their proximity to each other. Um, and uh, generally we want this to be set to yes. So by default, this is set to no. Um, so let's just change the parameter again. First, let's have a look at it. So um, here we have weed neighbors and you can see that's set to no. Um, the other parameter, the last one is weed zero elevation. So this is, um, for example, if you have a coastal area uh, where your digital elevation model does not have any value or is, uh, has value zero. So you can select this to weed all the possibly selected pixels. Um, in the area that is, for example, um, over a sea surface, that you definitely don't expect any valid points to be there. Now, um, let's set the uh, weed neighbors to yes. So let's type or copy rather. neighbors and we set it to yes here we go and we can now move on to run the steps so we type stamps for four and let's click enter And here we go. And you can see that some 120,000 uh, PS pixels within this small patch has been kept by, um, after dropping the noisy pixels. Now, this is the last step that we could perform, or you can perform all the steps on the, in one patch. However, if you then want to merge the patches, this happens at the end of step five. So this was the last step that we can do like this, um, unless we only want to process the one patch. So what we would need to do now, uh, we would need to basically process all the other patches. Uh, luckily, you don't have to do it one by one, as you have seen it here. And um, also, just to um, something that I have forgotten, the results of this weeding have been saved to a new, to basically the second selection, which is now given with a suffix two. So I can also type ls and then star. Sorry, star to map to see how many files are created now with this. So we can see that for each PS point, we now have a new um, MATLAB file. And we have the height, for example, the lambda, face, and so on. So now, as I said, we would need to rerun for the other um, patches. So to do this, we will go to the main directory like this. And here we go. Now, you can run for all the patches, or of course, for 14, we have already run it now, so we don't need to rerun it again. And we can, we also might want to select only some patches and not all of them, depending on the study area that we are interested in. Now, there is a file called patch list. We can see it in the main folder. I will go here to the folder and I will open it in mousepad instead because it's easier. You can see I have two files here. So this is the original one that I just saved to have a backup. And let me show you how it looks. So it contains basically just simply names of all the folders or patches that we have there. So uh, from one to 27. Now the patches are organized um, if you watched the webinar that from December 2020, the patches are organized there in um, three by nine. So three lines and nine columns. Basically, our data is divided to three lines and nine columns. And um, not always all the patches um, contain data that we are interested in. So we can limit the area by selecting the specific patches to be processed further. And I have done this in the main patch list here. So let me just open it. And this is the one that is going to be used, sonic patch.list. And 
I will use only patches 7 to 24, also leaving out the patch 14 because we have already processed it. So I will need to add it later. Um, but now for processing of all the patches, I should um, I should leave it out because otherwise it's going to be processed again. Nothing will happen. It will just take longer. So how do you select these patches really? So the patch number one for descending passes will be located um, in the upper right corner. So and the numbers will then go by rows. So it will be um, patch number one below will be patch number two and three and then next column four, five, six. So you see that we remove the first uh, two columns. So the two columns that are on the um, right side and then one last column that was on the left side. So we now have a little bit less uh, patches to process. And as I mentioned again, the number 14. Now we must not forget to add the number 14 before we run the step, step five. So this is just for um, this moment. Let me just minimize it because I will need to um, edit it right away. And then now if I wanted to run all the processing that I have now done for patch 14, I want to now run on these selected patches so I can uh, perform the merging uh, at the end of step five. And I can do that just by simply typing one to four. And now I would click enter. So for the purposes of this exercise, I've already pre-processed the data, so I will not run this here because it would take quite a while. But this is how we would pre-process all or process all the other patches uh, up to step four. So let me now go back to the patch list. And actually, I want to return patch 14 here. There we go. And I save it. And now I can close them. I can remove the last step that I wanted to do and I wanted I can move on to step five. So step five is the face correction. And at this step, the wrapped face of the selected pixels is corrected for the spatially uncorrelated look angle or digit elevation model error. So remember, we estimated this error in step two. And at the end of this step, all of the patches are merged, as I've already mentioned. Now, there's two main parameters that govern this step, and those are the merge resample size, which basically is um, just to save memory. So if you're running out of mem memory or having memory issues, you can have a co coarser grid to resample the data into. If you leave it as a zero, which is default, then no resampling will be performed. Now, if you do perform resam resampling, you can also set the uh, merge standard deviation parameter, which is a threshold standard deviation, which for each pixel, uh, the face of the noise standard deviation is computed. And if the standard deviation is greater than the threshold, then the resampled pixel is dropped. But again, this is only valid if um, any resampling is applied. OK, so let's run step five. And remember, step five has to be run from the INSAR main directory. Enter. Now this step takes a while, so And here we go, it's finished. And the results of this step are saved into the main directory with the suffix two, which contain basically all the information for the second selection of the PS points. And um, also is already merged for the entire uh, study area. So what we can now do is we can actually plot the wrapped phase for the entire study area and for all the interferograms. Now we do this again with the PS plot. So I state PS plot and W for wrapped face and enter. And here we go. And now we should scan all the interferograms to see if there is uh, any um, noise and um, what the coherence is. And we can then remove the ones if we see any overly noisy interferograms, we can still remove them for, for, from further processing, not to cause um, errors in the further processing, as I've mentioned. So of course, when we are looking like this, we cannot really judge a lot. So what we can do is 
visualize each interferogram one by one. So let me just uh, minimize this. I will not visualize all of them. That would take very long time. But I will just visualize the first one again to show you how to do this. So it's as we done before. And then, of course, W, because we want to visualize the dropped face. Then the next value is the background value. So previously, we have been using value 5, which corresponds to a mean amplitude of all the different images. However, um, now we can also use, for example, value 0 or 1. 0 is black background and 1 is white background. So let me use 1. This will also result in the uh, interferogram to be plotted um, in the lat long coordinates instead of just uh, plotted uh, basically in the radar, radar geometry. So let me put zero. Then we have the limits. There we just put zero for none. And then we put the first interferogram at the end. And here we go. Let me make it larger. And now we can see that our interferogram um, seems pretty smooth. Uh, of course, the uh, PS points are not um, not uniformly distributed, so we have somewhere more of them and somewhere less. But we can really clearly see all um, the fringes and so on. You can also notice that here in the wrapped interferogram, of course, the phase is from plus pi to minus pi. Now, this is going to be the focus of the next step. And let's say something about it. So the next step, or step six, is the phase unwrapping. And if you have watched any of our past webinars on Densar, you will probably know what this is. But let me just quickly go through it again. So when we measure phase, we can only measure it in the range of 0 to 2 pi. This corresponds to one wavelength. So when we imagine Sentinel-1, this has wavelength of 5.5 centimeters, meaning then that 0 to 2 pi is 5.5 centimeters. You can imagine that between the sensor and the ground, there will be a lot of 2 pi cycles or 5.5 centimeters long cycles before the wave travels to the ground. Now, if there is a difference between the two acquisitions of, for example, 7 centimeters, this is, of course, more than the two cycles, but we can only measure the difference um, in the or the fraction of the phase without the full cycles. So let's say it's seven centimeters, then the phase corresponding to the remaining uh, 1.5 centimeters um, is what we measure, but we do not measure the previous 5.5. This is called phase ambiguity, and we need to resolve it in order to get the absolute difference. So the seven centimeters instead of the 1.5. This phase ambiguity is solved during the so-called so phase unwrapping, which is the process of reconstructing the original phase shift from this wrapped representation. And it consists of adding and subtracting multiples of two uh, in the appropriate places to make the phase uh, image as smooth as possible. So we are trying to basically smooth it in here in space and time to um, actually try to reconstruct the original or actual absolute phase difference. This processing is controlled by a number of different parameters. They are all quite important, so I will go through them. First, for example, we have the unwrap method. Now, here we only have one option for PSI, and this is the 3D uh, unwrapping, which basically um, takes into account three-dimensional unwrapping, not only in space, but also in time. Now, the next parameter is, for example, the unwrapped per filter phase, which is by default set to yes. And this will cause the phase to be pre-filtered before unwrapping to reduce noise. This means that um, the spatially correlated look angle error and the master atmosphere and also the orbit error, which are actually ex estimated at step seven. So we have to rerun step six after step seven again. I will go back to that later, are removed to improve um, the unwrapping. But for now, this is not uh, important for us. And the next parameter, for example, is the unwrapped grid size, which again is um, uh, linked to the pre-filtering. So um, if the unwrapped pre-filter flag is set to yes, then the face is resampled to, um, to this grid. And it should be at least as large as the merge grid size. High values can reduce noise, but may lead to undersampling of their signal. So by default, this is set to 100. And again, we will not change this. 
The other parameters are linked to the Goldstein filter and they are the Goldstein alpha and the Goldstein window size. Then we have parameters such as the unwrap patch face, which is by default disabled. So this um, enables basically the unwrapping for each patch separately. Uh, generally, this is not recommended. And then we have uh, unwrap time window, which is again smoothing window in days for the unwrapping in the temporal domain. Okay, so now we can run the step. We will leave all the parameters as default. And let me just type six six and let's run it. Again, this step has to be run from the main directory. And here we go. Now the unwrapping is finished and we can visualize the first unwrapped infer interferogram. Of course, you can visualize all the interferograms. It's up to you. I will only show you the first one here. And basically we can use the same command that we have used previously, just changing here the value W to U. And here we go. And this is uh, the result of our unwrapping. And you can now see that instead of going from um, 3.1 or 1 pi to uh, minus 1 pi, we now go from 10 to minus 23 um, radians. You can also see that the face appears very smooth, the unwrapped face, so this is very good. There is no sudden jumps, there is no obvious errors that we can see at the moment, so that's very good. And we can now move on, so let me just minimize this window again. The next step is to estimate the atmospheric phase screen, or in other words, the uh, phase delay due to atmosphere. And this step is done by the dependency, stamps dependency, which is called train. I have already mentioned it in the beginning. And we will use the most simple method. Now, the atmospheric correction for INSAR time series is a relatively advanced topic. I will not go more into depth, into depth about it, um, but we will use the most basic version of it that is implemented in TRAIN. And that is the linear tropospheric correction that can be computed based on phase and topographic information. To run the calculation, we can simply type apps underscore linear and then the atmospheric or tropospheric contribution will be calculated for us. And here we go. And now we can actually plot the tropospheric correction or the tropospheric uh, contribution to the face separately. So let me just again type PS plot. And then we want to visualize the atmosphere. And we also have to give which type of the correction we have done or we have run. So we run the linear one, which in this case you denote as a linear. Here we go. And we can also choose only the first interferogram. So as usual, like this. And here we go. And here we have the result, which shows us the estimated uh, troposphere contribution to the face. So, and we can now continue. So this is just for the first interferogram. Of course, here the estimation should be different for each interferogram. So it is not always the same. And we can now move on to step seven. Step seven is the estimation of spatially correlated errors. So remember before in step three, we have calculated the uh, spatially uncorrelated error for look angle. Then we have removed this error at step five. And now in step seven, we want to remove the spatially correlated look angle error. And this basically includes the error in the digital elevation model itself, or for example, incorrect, incorrect mapping of the uh, dam onto the radar coordinates. The master atmosphere and orbit error are also estimated at this step, and we can visualize them at the end. Now, we, what we can do at this point is we can set one parameter, which is the 
uh, SCLA the ramp. Now, if this parameter is set to yes, a phase ramp is estimated for each interferogram and the estimated ramp will be subtracted. This is useful, uh, especially if we are, uh, for example, interested in local signals, but we can also play with this and see the effect on our study area. Now, I will only uh, run with this parameter set to yes, but when you're repeating this ex exercise, you can see the difference, for example, with uh, once running this enabled and once disabled. Now, once we run step seven, we will rerun the unwrapping, and I will explain to you in a little bit why. So let me now change the parameters. So I will write set and set it here we go and now we can run the steps so it would be there we go and let's click run And here we go. And once the processing is done, we can visualize the um, spatially correlated errors and also the um, master atmosphere and the estimated ramps. So let's now visualize them. So again, we will do this, do this with the PS plot. And we will visualize first the uh, total dam error. Um, and this is given in a radians per meter of baseline. And let's now just type D. There we go. And here we are. You can see that the error per meter of baseline is very small, but of course it's per meter of baseline. So uh, we of course have to um, also check the baseline. And then the next one that we can check is the uh, master atmosphere. So we have before estimated the tropospheric um, correction or tropospheric contribution to the phase. And now this step also estimated the contribution of the master atmosphere. So that is then S P S M for master. And here we go. So we can see that here the values are actually much larger. And the next one that we can visualize is the estimated ramps. So again, this would be given by PS and O. And here we go. Here we have the estimated ramps as well. Okay, so once we do this and we run step seven, it is highly recommended to now rerun step six. And I have already briefly mentioned this during the running of step six, where we were mentioning the parameter to uh, remove the um, SCLA error. And this corresponds, of course, to the spatially correlated look angle error and the master atmosphere and the orbit error that we have just estimated. So uh, this is why we want to rerun now the phase unwrapping, because at the phase unwrapping, then all of these errors will be removed or all of these phase contributions will be removed before the phase unwrapping, uh, which will significantly aid the phase unwrapping and remove any potential issues. OK, so let's start. So um, first thing that we can also do before we even rerun the step six, we can actually check if we have any unwrapping errors. Now, we already checked the inter unwrapped interferograms before. But what we can now do is, due to the fact that we have the estimated noise already for each interferogram, we can visualize it by just uh, typing PS info again. And here we go. So now we don't only have the baseline here, but we also have the calculated 
estimated noise for each interferogram. Now, anything that is above 80 degrees is um, likely to give tr trouble during the unwrapping, but you can see that this doesn't really happen in our data set. And this is due to the fact that Sentinel-1 data usually have a very small and very tightly controlled baselines. So they're ideal for PSI and for uh, differential interferometry. And we can now visualize the unwrapped phase also with the removed um, master uh, atmosphere, the uh, total dam error, and also the ramps. So to do this, we just simply, again, I will choose now here, just because I will show it only for the first um, interferogram again, but you can show for all, of course, if you just remove the, um, the number of the interferogram. And here you just type the unwrapped phase minus the MO. So D stands for the total dam error, M is the master atmosphere, and O are the estimated RAMs. And we can simply visualize it. And you can then also compare it with the unwrapped phase before removing all of these um, errors and phase contributors and see the difference. So let me just quickly find it. And here we go. And here you can see that the, in the one that we have removed the contribution of the dam error, the master atmosphere and the ramps, we have the range smaller than in the original unwrapped phase. So this is what we would expect and it's a good sign. Let me then rerun the step six and seven. And I will simply do this by Here we go. So I start with step six until step seven. And this basically, as I said already before, will remove all of these spatially correlated errors um, and others from the data before the unwrapping, which can aid and improve the unwrapping process. So let me just click enter. And here we go. And now, theoretically, we could again plot the unwrapped phase, for example, for the first interferogram. So we can simply do it um, to run the same step that we have run before. And we can compare the results. So you see that the values are slightly different, so some change has happened. So this um, removement, uh, removing of the um, of the errors must have actually contributed. And otherwise, we can see that it's almost similar, but uh, we do see some change in the maximum values. OK, so now let's move on to the uh, step that we have all been waiting for, which is the estimation of the deformation velocity. Now, simply, this is done again by PS plot. So we type PS plot and B for velocity. And there we go. Now, this velocity is estimated from the unwrapped phase, but without the um, dam errors and ramps and atmosphere removed. So this is the first one. And then we can also, of course, remove all of these other um, contributions, estimate the velocity based on the unwrapped phase with all of these removed. And that will be simply done by typing and here, because we are using the A, so remember that it was the atmosphere contribution that we have estimated using train before the step six. And now we can now we can simply just write because we have to provide the type that we have done. And let's click enter. And here we go. So if we put these two velocity maps next to one another. This is the original one done without the ramps, the atmosphere, and the dam 
total DEM errors removed. You can see that the range of the values is quite different. Here, the range is smaller, although we have a higher values here in the positive uh, range than here. And But again, we have lower values in the negative range here. And this velocity is given in millimeters per year. So we can see that here we have maximum of um, some 18 centimeters per year, basically. OK. Um, now, we can see that they are quite different in some regions, for example, here. And then we, we can see a difference here. So here it would seem like the atmosphere, mostly the atmosphere, is uncovering or introducing an area which appears to be subsiding. Now, we cannot really judge at this point uh, whether this is real subsidence, for example, due to a position of a volcano, or um, which is basically subsiding, for example, after an eruption. Um, I do not think so, but again, I would need to have more information about this area to really be able to reject it or uh, confirm the fact that the subsidence is happening here since we don't see it um, at all in the velocity estimated only from uh, on, without the removal of the atmosphere and the um, other errors. Now, to check whether this is really atmosphere, we can also basically just remove the orbits and the dem error, and we can see the difference. Okay, so you see that here this does not occur. So that truly means that this is either uncovered or introduced by the troposphere correction. So as I said, Without having closer information and hopefully also some GPS points, I cannot confirm or reject this. There is relatively very high mountains in this area, so it can be that simply the uh, linear tropospheric uh, correction method does not give us uh, good results for this area, and then we end up with uh, some skew, skewed results. Okay, so let me minimize these. And if we want to really find out whether atmosphere is different in each of our images and whether it has effect, what we can also do is run the estimation of the velocity while dropping always one interferogram and seeing what effect this has on the velocity estimation. If there is interferogram that has very strong atmospheric um, contribution, then there should be a clear effect on the velocity estimations when we remove, once we remove it. So let's try this. And we simply do this again by PS plot. So let me just go back here. And here, instead of V, it is V drop. And I also want to remove the uh, ramps and the, the total dam error. And here we go. And when we increase the window, to see a little bit more detail. Okay, so now when we look at all of the images here, we can see that there is really no difference between them or not, no difference that we can easily see like this, which probably means that in our time series, it appears that the effect of the atmosphere in any one image is very small um, and no diff we can basically see no differences. So there doesn't seem to be need for removing any interferogram. And as I said, the effect of the atmosphere seems to be small, at least not um, temporally specific, basically, for one image. OK, so now we have the estimated velocity values. But these are um, values relative to the mean velocity of the entire image. So zero is not actually zero. And we would, of course, want to uh, know exactly what the absolute velocity values are in the loss direction or line of sight direction. We can do this by setting a reference area, uh, or even more ideally, by having a GPS measurement for a specific point and knowing with known velocity uh, that we can basically reference our, um, our measurement or estimate velocity to. In general, it's best to find an area if we do not have a GPS point where no change is expected, which in this case is generally on the west side of the city. But again, I do not have any, um, any GPS points. And we can do this by in the, get, in the 
um, set parameters. So if I type again, get parm, there is options here that are called ref center long lat. Then we have ref lat long uh, ref long and ref radius. Uh, ref lat radius. Sorry. So and also reference velocity. So, for example, um, let's say that I want to choose a circular area. So I can choose either area that is circular or rectangular. And for singular, for, sorry, for circular area or circle, I would choose the center latitude longitude and then the radius. And if I want to choose um, an area which is rectangular, then I just basically put minimum and maximum latitude and minimum and maximum longitude. Now, of course, if we have a GPS measurement and we know how much this point, if we, for example, select only a very small area, which is a point measurement, GPS measurement, how much it is moving, then we can set the velocity here. If we do not have that, we can look for an area that we expect not to be moving or not to be deforming, and we can leave the reference velocity as zero. Now, of course, this is um, depending on our knowledge of the area, um, which I do not have much, so I cannot um, be sure that what I select here is correct. So I would definitely recommend to have very good knowledge of the area or GPS points to really be sure that the referenced or absolute velocities are correct in your case. Now, to just show you how this works, I will set a circular area and we can basically check it if I now go to open Google Maps, uh, Google Earth, sorry. There we go. Okay, and the area that I have chosen is somewhere here. So this area is already, as I said, on the slopes and it's not on the clay, located on the clay deposits um, in the bottom of the valley. So I would hope it's not, um, it's not deforming. But then again, I really have to say that I do not know. So if you're um, performing this on a different study area, you really need to know, or know the characteristics of the area and know where you are expecting deformation and what is um, likely to be area that is non-deforming or, for example, have GPS measurements. So I can just simply choose an area here, for example, and read the coordinates here in the bottom. Uh, I've already selected coordinates, so I will put them there. And I can simply do that by set parm. And then I will choose the parameter that is called ref center long lat. And the value will be minus 99.280. And for longitude, of course, and without a comma, 0.446. So this is my center of the circle that I want to choose in my reference area. Click enter, and then my next will be ref radius and that is simply a number in meters and I can choose for example 100 so it's going to be 100 meter radius there we go and now if I visualize the velocity again we can see that 29 points have been selected in my reference area and here we have the velocity and we can see that the range now changed it changed a bit. So let me go back here. And basically. You can see that the center of 
um, or the zero point has changed or moved uh, as compared to the previous one. So again, I would need to be absolutely sure that that is zero. Um, I am not. And you can see that the reference point is also visualized here or located here on the map. You can see it. OK, so let's move on. And final step, uh, final visualization step is to visualize the time series. And we, we can simply do this by adding um, TS option or time series option to our gra uh, graph. So if I rerun this step and I, for example, want to also run it with the atmosphere removed and I can just type at the end TS and this will enable the time series option. And we can then estimate or also see the time series for a specific point that we choose in the graph. And we can see how many points are located in a specific radius around that, that specific point that we chose and so on. And here we go. So you can see there is some other things added down here and we have radius. So we can select, set this to 200 or whatever we like to basically have the area from which we want to calculate the time series. So if I now go here for the time series tool, it will give, he, give me these crosshairs. And for example, I want to go to this area, which has the highest deformation. And I can, I can click here. And this is now my time series. And I also have a graph of the point points within a hundred meter radius from which this time series was calculated. So for each graph, this is not a specific point that we click on because you can see that here where I clicked, there is actually no PS point located. So it takes the hundred meter radius, takes all the points and calculates the mean velocity for that area. And then it plots them for the uh, by the time, basically, so for the 30 different interferograms that I have. Finally, what we can also do is to uh, plot the standard deviation, velocity standard deviation. And we can do this by running command that is called ds. And I can remove the time series here and click enter. And here we go. This is the standard deviation for the velocity that we can see and it moves between one to nine millimeters per year, which is actually quite a big difference, of course. So I will not go today into why the reasons for this could be, but because we are running out of time already for this tutorial. So this is where I will leave it. So remember our last results were the time series of velocity right here. And um, we saw the time series, basically, not this one but here, time series for a specific selected point and the estimated uh, movement velocity. Now, there is other tools that you can use next. You can use the step eight. You can also uh, visualize the data using the stamps visualizer, which I have actually included in the tutorial. But here we don't have time for it anymore, so uh, I left it out or I will leave it out. But if you are interested in it, have a look at the tutorial and you can find all of these extra steps. Also, for example, the export to KML to be able to visualize the data in Google Earth. OK, so I hope this has been useful and interesting for you. And I'm sure there is many questions and I will be back in a couple of seconds to answer them.